Hi there. I thought today we could talk about an SGI Indigo 2. Actually, I really wanted to talk about the SGI Indigo, but I managed to zap the CPU board. And then I thought I'd talk about the SGI Indy, and remembered that the power supply in my Indy is shot. Uh, however, I have three working Indigo 2s, so we're moving back up one. The Indigo 2 was introduced not too long after the Indigo, in fact, uh, within a couple of years. Uh, and the Indigo is a fantastic machine, but the Indigo 2 totally blows it out of the water. Um, not only in the CPUs that were offered, but the flexibility of the system is just unbelievable. And you can see that it's not a particularly pretty case. SGI, of course, is well known for not another beige box. And it's a box, but it's certainly not beige. The case is very heavy, uh, and it's quite large. But this is to accommodate the aforementioned flexibility in the system, and we'll get to that when we start taking them apart. Let's turn it on. As with the Indigo and the Indy, uh, the Indigo 2 plays a startup chime. There. Uh, and as I said, the Indigo 2 was introduced in um, 1992, which is not at all long after the original Indigo. And it Stopped production in 98, so it was a relatively short-lived uh, machine. They generally ran these systems in groups of three. You would have the low-end desktop, you'd have the badass graphics workstation, and then you'd have the monstrous visualization server. And in the case of this series of machines, the low end server was the, or the low end uh, desktop machine was the Indy. And then we had the Indigo 2, and then finally the Onyx. Uh, my Indigo 2, I was given by a friend, uh, this unit that is. The other two, which are also in working order, uh, I picked up in a surplus sale in Minneapolis, I think. Anyways, this particular machine. Uh, and I'm not quite sure how easy it is to read from that distance. It is an IP28. The IP number in SGI land referred to the processor type and kind of the architecture, but not really. So where this was an IP28 being a R10,000, then the R4000 was an IP22, I believe, and the R8000 was an IP27, something like that. Uh, this unit is a 195 MHz R10,000 with floating point processor. It's got uh, a MIG of L2 cache, 640 megs of RAM. It's got two graphics card, both of them are solid impacts, and then an internal SCSI disk and onboard audio. The machines originally came out with a 100 MHz R4000. Let's boot her up. There we go. Uh, and over its lifetime, it went from that 100 megahertz R4000 to the R4400 series, which came from 100 to 250 megahertz. It also came out with an R4600, which is kind of like the Celeron of the R4000 world. It's a little cost reduced, not quite as powerful. That came at 133 megahertz. Then there was the Power Indigo 2, which came with an R8000 at 75 megahertz. And then finally, the impact units which were purple, and they came in our 10,000s, and they were 175 and 195 megahertz. Now, the 75 megahertz R8000 sounds like a sort of funny number to be in the middle of it, but do keep in mind that as um, newer processor architectures came out, even if clock speed they went backwards, they were actually more powerful processors. The uh, 195 MHz R10K in this, for example, would be on even footing with, say, a 350 MHz Pentium 3. Uh, so it's not the clock speed, but how they accomplish the job that makes them impressive. The uh, Oh, I, I misspoke, I'm sorry. 
the uh, Impact series refers to the graphics card, not the processor. Uh, the 10,000 label was stuck on the machine if it had an R10K. You had um, several sets of graphics cards. Uh, there you go. Where's my little thing? My demograph? No, cycles. Oh, oh cool. Huh. I didn't know I had Tron installed. That's not what I wanted, though. Now, how in the hell did I lose it? Ah, there it is. Now, this is what made the R10Ks, or the Indigo 2 in general, much more impressive than anything else on the market. In fact, when the R10K Impacts came out, they were, hands down, the most powerful machines on the market. Uh, in terms of both processor power and graphics power. I know, I'm just playing with myself. Right, where was I? Graphics. So you had the original series of graphics cards, which were um, basically lifted from the Indigo. And they came in the XL, XZ, and Extreme and then you had the impacts, which came as solid high and max, with the three different variants. And as you might have guessed, as the uh, variants move up, the power of the graphics set uh, increased. Come on! An OS that comes installed with Doom? you got to love it! Oh, and it has sound. I forgot. <clears throat> The graphics cards came in one, two, or three card configurations. So the XL and the Solid Impact is one card. The XZ and the High Impact is two cards. And then the Extreme and the Max are three cards. And um, they had, as you might have guessed, more components. So they would parallelize the jobs and you'd be able to throw more stuff through it. The solids didn't have any texture processors, for example, whereas the highs and the maxes did. So there are certainly some compromises in the solids. All of the texture stuff is done in CPU. Uh, my machine has two solid uh, cards because I stole one from, I think, that indigo over there, which you can't see. Um, they could dual head. Obviously, it's only got a limited number of slots, so it would depend on what you're trying to stuff into it. But... Um, you were also supposed to upgrade the process, or sorry, the power supply, which I kind of didn't do. So, anyways, I'm sure it won't go bang. Why don't we shut this down for now? Oh, it erred. Oh well. Shut the system. Yeah, I think now. Off you go then. The machines came with anywhere from 16 meg of RAM to officially 640. The R4000 series maxed out at 384, but the R10000s maxed out at 640. However, you could uh, stick more RAM in because at the time that the 640 was the max, the largest stick that you got, I think, was 32 meg. So with 64s and 128s, you could actually bump it up as high as a gig. Um, this machine, as I said, only has 640, but that's stacked out, obviously, for its configuration. Let's take it apart. So I keep mentioning flexibility, and that's quite an important uh, function of this rather bulky case design. The um, case is large because it covers, well, not only all of those processor architectures and all of those cards, but several discs and a pretty sizable mainboard as well. So we have behind the front fascia, we've got two three and a half inch third height drives on these rather lovely engineered slids. Oh, and a shower of purple plastic. So very easy to slot the slids in, locating pins. That's kind of the thing that I really liked about the SGI's not only their uh, attractive cases, because they were so very different, but they were well engineered. And I think maybe at some point I'll do a video on apples, which I know sounds horrifically boring, but the engineering that went into the late 80s and early to mid 90s apples is really quite impressive. Uh, and 
certainly SGI is either no exception oops, or led the way. Let's pop the top case off. You'll see mine are all scratched to hell. Uh, that uh, on the top case that is. That is because these cases are so hefty and so strong. Most people stuck their monstrous CRTs on them. So you had 19, 20, even 21 inch Sony GDM uh, SGI monitors, which weigh a ton. Uh, so tended to scratch the hell out of the skins, which is unfortunate. But so uh, three and a half inch. We also have a half height. Five and a half inch bay. I don't actually have a spud tray for this, but this is where it gets cool. So, this mantles very easily. Let's pop the scuzzy cable off the back. Inside, we have drive bays at front. We've got Power supply in back behind this SCSI ribbon cable. We have our, get the damn SCSI out of the way. We have our memory, uh, and it is 12 slots, I think. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. Uh, and then our processor, and then the card cage. Uh, and a single angled system fan here. Come on, that is beautiful. I've got a retention bar here. I've already popped the screw out. And then pull on the tabs and the card comes out. This is the solid graphics card. Uh, and this one's only got one because I stole it from the other one. We have some massive heat spreaders on the top and even on the underside. 13W3, of course. And we have, this is the GIO64 bus, which as the name suggests is 64 bits, and then a proprietary power connector. The solid impacts had um, all of the components, well, except for the texture processor, on board, but were fewer in number. Um, if you recall my Onyx 2, uh, we got a little bit into the graphics set. Uh, and I stress a little bit because I don't really understand graphic systems very well. I have a hard time wrapping my head around them. But uh, in the Onyx 2, you had the, oh, what did it go? It was the geometry engine, the raster managers, and then the display generator. And in this, you have, and this is a kind of a precursor of the um, set in the Onyx 2s, uh, a command engine, a geometry engine, a raster engine, and then finally the display generator. In the case of the Solid Impact, the top of the line beastie, it had multiple raster engines and geometry engines. Uh, I think, I might get this wrong, forgive me, it had 16 uh, geometry engines over two boards, whereas this only has two or four. So, anyways, so we have our bus. And this is another nifty trick of the Indigo 2. So we have our GIO slots here. We have our high amperage power connectors here. These are 3.3 volts. And then we have ESA bus, E-I-S-A, or extended ISA. Uh, in terms of buses, for those who are as, well, younger than I am, I guess. Uh, these days, you know, it's all PCI Express and things like that. Uh, you know, before PCI Express, there was... Oh, AGP, and then there was PCI 64, and then there was, and you work your way back. ESA was an attempt to increase the bit width and the speed of the ISA bus. ISA came in 8 and 16 bits, then ESA was 32 bits, and it had a very different um, slot construction, uh, unlike, for example, PCI and Visa. Uh, for those who don't remember, Visa was an 8 or 16 bit ISA slot, and then you had an extension slot that sat over here, uh, and it was identical to a PCI slot, but a different color. And this was before PCI was really um, b blowing out onto the scene. 
uh, it was uh, in limited production. And so you'd have a single very long card, much like the um, graphics card here. And you'd have your ISA here, and then it would plug into the Visa here. Uh, and, you know, it worked okay. It never really got the market share, got thrown out, plus the double connector thing is kind of cack-handed. It should be said, though, that one should never accidentally slot a PCI card into a Visa slot. And you would think that nobody would be daft enough to do it, but you would be wrong, and that usually let the magic smoke escape. Anyways, ESA was kind of cool because it was designed um, not only as a wider bus and a faster bus than ISA, but it had a lot of additional features, one of which they really pushed was plug-and-play. And the idea was is that your operating system would have a huge slew of configuration files and sort of generic drivers. And so what would happen is you would slot in, say, three um, Ethernet cards. And when the OS came up, it would scan the bus, find the cards. Using the um, serial numbers on the cards, it would then pull up the correct drivers. So you didn't have to specify which drivers to load. And it would auto-configure itself. Um, it usually worked, not always. These machines, as in these specific ones, I think came with some quad Ethernet port 4, uh, F-O-R-E, um, Ethernet cards. But, of course, they don't work on anything but these, so I popped them out. Uh, okay, so, bus, and then processor. And um, I've already loosened some of the screws. Let me find my little screwdriver. Uh, let's see. So, as I said, this is a 195 MHz R10K, uh, which was a wonderful processor in its time. And it has a monstrous heat sink. Um, I can't think of any of them that I've seen that's larger than this. The R4400s, had, and the R4000s, had a very tall but small sink. Uh, I don't know what an 8000 sink looked like, um, but I do know that the board sat and, like, tilted up. This, however, is in one very large... Oh, oopsie-daisy, I forgot the back screws. Tuck, 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 tuck. One very large module, and not only do you have the sink on top, but there's another sink on the bottom as a heat spreader. Uh, I'm not positive either what else is on here and I'm afraid unlike the octanes where I had 15 of them so I just took the silly thing apart after having killed my indigo the other day I'm a little nervous to start tearing these things to pieces so I will not be opening it up sorry right where was I we have our massive aluminium block we've got our fan uh, the fan pulls the air in and then blows it out across the veins uh, it does not recede any further into the block. We have four very large Allen bolts which connect to the bottom plate. Oh, lost a screw. And uh, squeeze the CPU between. We've got our CPU connector. And then this rather lovely copper tape here. Right, so SGI Indigo 2. Wonderful, wonderful, flexible machine. I'm going to see if I can get something else running. I know I haven't gotten back to the PDP. As you may have guessed, I've kind of gotten stuck. Uh, so what I'll try and do is get an update to explain how I've gotten stuck. Maybe somebody can come up with a suggestion. I would like to try and get back into doing these kinds of videos, mostly because they're easy and I can crank them out at a better rate and not be quite so lame duck. 2012 was a useless year for this channel. Sorry. Uh, plus, I do have a little bit of impetus. A chap I know back in the motherland is starting doing these kind of videos, and since I was doing them four years first, my ego is taking a battering, and I need to get my act together. SGI Indigo 2, a wonderful system. Pick up one today. If you have been, thank you very much for watching. I appreciate all of your comments. As always, take care of yourselves. Thank you.